Okay, so uh, this session we are going to talk about quality management, ethics, and corporate social responsibility. So CSR is actually very, very important nowadays, and because of a lot of issues happening and a lot of uh, wrong misconduct that a lot of employees have, have performed, now ethics is really highlighted in different companies. So major topics that we want to talk about is definition and overview of ethics, uh, trust and total quality, of values and total quality, integrity and total quality, responsibility and total quality, manager's role in ethics, and organizational roles in ethics for this chapter. Okay. So going back to definition of ethics or overview of ethics, uh, the quality management and ethics and corporate social responsibility, actually we are dealing with ethical dilemmas. Like, can everybody hear me? Can you confirm if you can hear me, please? Okay, so Ms. Mina, uh, the reason you're not hearing me is probably uh, your own speakers. They're not uh, working or something like that because everybody else is hearing me. Okay, so handling ethical dilemmas. Uh, we are talking about uh, dilemmas that happen every single day. There are a lot of times that there, there, we have to choose between two choices. And one of them is the ethical uh, choice. And uh, ironically, that ethical choice is always the harder one. So the one which is unethical, the one which is uh, like easy to do without uh, any trouble is mostly the unethical one. And the ethical one is always the harder one. So we face those dilemmas every day. And <laughs> It is really important that any coach, any coach is really important. Then uh, codes and business conduct. So businesses have different codes. Mostly they, when they are, they're doing their business, they they basically come up with codes and uh, ethical codes to make sure that everybody follows those codes and everybody is. Uh, following those ethical rules. Uh, models for making ethical decisions, they always come up with different models that everyone can follow and uh, is practical to everyone. Then uh, beliefs versus behavior. So uh, there is this argument, uh, common argument of beliefs, beliefs versus behavior that most of us will do stuff that we believe much easier than those that we don't believe in. So if there's an ethical issue that your employees don't believe in that, uh, they, it's very hard for them to, to, to do what you ask them. So, so this is really important. This is really important that uh, we make sure that our employees they believe in the ethical codes and conduct that we are we are promoting or asking them to, to do. And because if they don't, the the chance that they do it is much less than when they, they believe in. So there are ethical dilemmas in cases every day. Uh, this would be probably our our task in the class today. Uh, and then corporate social responsibility. So corporate social responsibility is that corporations, they have a social responsibility. It means that besides their profit, I mean, even though we are all in it for money, we are all making money, but definitely we, we have certain responsibility uh, for society. And this is being defined as social uh, responsibility and it's uh, not something that we can just get by it. We, we have a certain responsibility and we have to be held accountable to it. So it's not just 
something optional nowadays. It's something obligatory. It's something that without it, our our corporation is actually uh, uh, questionable. It's uh, if you are just in it for money and you are not taking any responsibility for the society, we are we are not performing or doing what we are supposed to do. And there are a lot of uh, ways for for people and uh, you know society to respond to it by not buying our products, by not you know supporting our services. So this is really important. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, no questions. Can everybody hear me again one more time because I received because I received a, a comment from Mr. Nazari that he can't hear me. Can everybody hear me clearly? Okay, very good. Okay, so ethical dilemmas, uh, Mr. Akmal, if I'm not mistaken, was asking uh, what do we mean by, yeah, ethical dilemma, dilemma. Ethical dilemmas are those situations that you have two choices and both of them are hard like you're choosing between two bad choices and mostly uh, it's, it's really hard because one of them is mostly not that much profitable that much to your advantage but one is mostly the ethical one uh, so, so then it's really hard for you because if you choose the ethical choice uh, there's not necessarily any money in it for you. So it, it makes it hard. It makes it hard to decide. But but definitely choosing the ethical choice is is in the long run to your advantage because there there are times that companies can get by on ethical choices and they make the unethical choice and make that money and are successful for that quarter, but in the long run, you get back to them and it brings them down. So, so if you are in it for a long-term relationship, if you are in it for 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 sustainable, uh, reliable business you want to offer to your customers, I do advise you to always stick to your values and ethics, and never never shortchange your clients or customers on, on ethical values because they, they feel that, they, they realize it. And those companies that have, been, that have been around for a long time are those who are sticking to their ethical uh, values. So I do advise you to do that. Uh, yeah, a good example. A good example is when Enron had this problem. The the uh, whistleblower, or the accountant lady who 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 realized there's something fishy going on, and instead of trying to uh, be part of the game and make money off of off of the corruption of the top management. Uh, that they were using the investors money, the, the stockholders money and they were using it as expenses or whatever and faking the, the balance sheets and uh, you know just stealing people's money. She, she, she took the hard decision. She, she, she chose to disclose 
and let everybody know what's going on. And it ended up in Enron, a huge company, which was one of the Forbes companies, go down, way down, and they just closed down. So, so it was really, it's really hard. Sometimes you have to. Uh, people, people won't like it. I mean, you're trying to tell them that you're corrupt. You're telling everyone that they're corrupt. This is not that they like it, and sometimes they will, they will, they will face against you, and they will do something against you. But, but doing the right thing is, is the matter. You know, you gotta do the right thing. That's that's what that's what you gotta do. So that's that's probably a good example, Mr. Uh Okay. Then, uh, then going back to ethics. The uh, definition of ethics is actually about doing the right thing, as, as I just mentioned, within a moral framework. So a moral framework is beyond a lot of a lot of definitions or a lot of realms or uh, you know borders. You are going beyond religion or culture or anything else. It's moral. It's it's about values, the human values. So it's mostly international. The ethics is mostly international, and it doesn't doesn't uh, uh, rely on all those ma smaller uh, definitions or domains. So the most common impediment to ethical conduct is human nature, because human nature people tend to behave according to perceived personal interests. So our our nature. We are wired in the sense that we, we respond, respond naturally to something positive or negatively. We, we will actually uh, rely on certain preferences we have, and those preferences are torn according to our values. So based on those values, we, we take action, we, we do something, or we refrain from doing something. So those are the best tools for us to realize whether we should do something or we shouldn't do something. Okay. Any questions on definition of ethics or comments? Ethical behavior is a key aspect of total quality management. To the reason for this may be the important participation by the whole workforce. Yes, absolutely. Very nice point, Ms. Hasuda. Ethical behavior is very important in total quality management. We'll get there in our next slides. It's actually it's it's, it's one of the foundations of uh, total quality management because we are focusing on bettering our services and products and. And a lot of companies, they can get by with what they're, what they're doing without bettering their service and quality. You know, a lot of companies decide instead of improving their quality, they just decide to go into marketing uh, plans or investment plans or any other plans that bring them more money than quality. Because quality speaks for itself. When you're providing a better quality service or product, it, it is marketing in itself. But, but sometimes you do marketing even though your quality is not as good as it should be. So, so in it itself is a good ethical uh, program. It's an, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ethical approach to to getting customer satisfaction. So just you choosing total quality management as your approach is ethical because it's the right thing to do. So that's to begin with. Then later on, in order to be successful in total quality management, we have been discussing and explaining the teamwork in the workforce, support, coaching, all these are values or moral values that are are necessary in order to be successful in total quality management. So these are really interrelated to each other. And without 
without being ethical? How could you coach your subordinates? How could you help them out if you want to if you want to just benefit like materially rather than the whole company uh, succeeds together? Because if you look at it individually, total quality management is more of a teamwork rather than individual work. Whereas if you're just in it for money or success for your own self, it's less teamwork to you. To you is just you. So you want to be successful. You don't care if others are going to be successful or not. You just want to be successful, uh, you know, without any concerns for others. So this is this is absolutely important. Uh, achieving quality through the efforts of people either involves supervising them relentlessly or it involves trusting them. Yes, absolutely. And they trust you. They have to trust you as well. It's like a both way trust. Without trust, you won't be successful. So you won't be succeeding if you don't have the trust towards your uh, employees or your peers. And if they don't, don't trust you. So it actually goes both ways. Okay. What values promote ethical behavior? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, values are, as I said, the uh, our preferences. The the preferences that we have developed over times, I would say, centuries or decades or centuries. Uh, Human beings, we have natural preferences, like stealing. We we don't like that. We, we naturally, it's something we don't conceive of something good. It could be at any level. It could be at shoplifting. It could be at being at a, an accountant and just misrepresenting the figures and numbers. It could be as a CEO by taking an unethical bonus for yourself which you don't deserve, which is, a, which is the shareholder's money. It could be at any, any, any level. I mean, it could be at any level. It could be at any industry or any position in the corporation. But that is something we don't, we don't prefer. The society doesn't prefer. It's against our values of honesty, integrity, care. Uh, you know, all these are... Are all these are? Uh, can does everybody hear my my voice pretty low, or is it all right? And everybody can everybody can hear it clearly. Let me just uh, clarify that. Okay. Can everybody tell me if my voice is clear or not? So, Mr. Nazari, I think it's your own speaker that has a problem uh, because everybody can hear me pretty well, as you can see in the chat box. So, I would advise you either to log out and log back in, or uh, you know, first check your speakers on your computer, or if, you, or if you're using a headset, make sure it's well connected to your computer. And then, if if it's all right, then. Uh, Try logging out and logging back in and see if it works. Otherwise, I don't know, it probably is your internet connection. Okay. Okay, I will, uh, I will uh, restart and then uh, I will try to see where is the problem and then, yeah, okay, you can, meantime, you can continue. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay, so yeah, so those values are coming from our preferences. Those are coming from our culture, or from 
from the values that our society believes in, our human nature, everything like that. So all through those uh, years of living, our experiences will, will define our ethical values. So then is the matter of trust that uh, Ms. Masudai also mentioned is critical element of ethics. You know, uh, the total quality management, we are dealing with trust. We, we need to trust each other. Many of the fundamental elements of total quality depend on trust and ethical behavior, including communication, interpersonal relations, conflict management, problem solving, teamwork, employee involvement and empowerment and customer focus. Trust can be built by being loyal to those not present, keeping promises, and sincerely apologizing when necessary. So uh, when it comes to trust, it's also a matter of giving our trust to, to our uh, employees and having their trust in return. So many of the fundamental elements of total quality depend on trust and ethical behavior. So communication, when we communicate, we need to be able to trust each other because without trust, those, those communication is not going to work pretty well because, because for me to be able to rely on what you tell me, I have to be able to trust you in the first place. That uh, interpersonal relationship, how we, we, we have our relationship with each other is also depending on trust. And managing the conflicts, you know, there are times that we have conflicts and miscommunication with each other and the only way for us to, uh, for, for us to, to fix that problem is to trust each other. I mean that trust is not that we just trust somebody who doesn't deserve to be trusted, but you're talking about a trust that is well deserved, and it's both ways. Then problem solving. Solving the problems depends a lot on having trust and trusting each other. And um, teamwork, when we want to work together, we got to trust each other and by trust we build that rapport so that we can help each other out and make ourselves successful. Then involving the employees and empowering them. So that empowerment, the trust is really big for empowering the employees because you won't be able to empower the employees unless you trust them. If you, if you are of the opinion that they, they're going to make a mess, if you, give them some authority, you will not give them that authority because you don't believe in them. Because you think they can't do it and that's why you, you just want to be a control freak and control them all the time. So that's not going to work. If you want to empower an employee, you got to give them that authority needed to, to perform and make that total quality management work for you. So without that authority and empowerment, the total quality management is not going to work, and to empower an employee, you got to trust them first. So, so they they go together. Then customer focus, focusing on customers is trusting their needs and preferences, and that is also very important when it comes to uh, total quality management. So trust can be built by being loyal to those who are not pre present. So those customers who are not there when you're making their product, by making sure you're meeting certain quality standards, they not necessarily will realize it. I mean, they will realize it by experiencing their product, by <coughs> but by then it might be too late. You know, like let's say in car industry, when your brakes have a problem, you're making cars, you're making tons of cars, like thousands and thousands of cars and all of them, they have some brake issues, you're risking your customers' lives, and they're not there, they're not present, but by being loyal to them, you make sure they're 
bricks have the highest standard possible. That's why even before a problem occurs, you see like to Toyota or you know uh, Honda or all those like successful car companies, they recall their cars because they don't want any problems happening to the customers. They're incurring those costs to make sure the security and safety of their customers. That is called loyalty, even though the customers are not present yet. They don't want to risk their lives. Keeping your promises, when you, when you guarantee a certain level of standards for your products and services, you got to keep that. You, you got to keep it up. You can't just deliver promises that you are not going to deliver. And sincerely apologizing. So when you make mistakes by acknowledging that, you are creating that trust in your customers and clients. So values, we, we, did, we, uh, uh, we discussed values a bit. So values are those core beliefs that uh, basically guide our behavior. So those core beliefs, they, they tell us what to do and not to do. Individuals and organizations apply their knowledge and skills most willingly to efforts in which they believe. As I mentioned earlier, you only perform and do stuff that you believe, and it's much easier to do that rather than doing something you're told without believing it's correct. And then uh, apply your knowledge and skills most willingly. Managers should work to establish an environment in which values uh, that lead to ethical behavior and values that lead to peak performance are the same. So it's really important. There, are, there it is funny because, like in bank industry, it's really a very uh, bad dilemma for most of their employees. Like make major, major banks in the United States at least, and I'm sure in, uh, it's, it's the case all over the uh, globe, they have some ethical standards. Like let's say when it comes to the bankers, they tell them what is ethical to do and what is not ethical to do. And they advise them to do the ethical, of course, because it's against the law. They have to. So they, they start learning those ethical values, but when it comes to practice, the approach of the companies are are like forcing them into the unethical practices. So what the management rewards you and what what ethical behaviors and values rewards you are two different things. And that's the go and that's the company's policy. So the company has chosen to tell you the ethical values but is not in action promoting them. And actually, the one that is promoted and is the most rewarding is the unethical values. And unfortunately, it's uh, chasing most of the big banks, like Wells Fargo, Chase, uh, Bank of America, all these banks here. And I'm sure over there, there are certain other banks. So, so what, what happens is the employee in the long run decides to let go of those ethical behaviors because those are not rewarding. So it's the management responsibility to make sure the ethical values are well rewarded, not discouraged. So integrity requires honesty, but it's more than just honest. It, integrity is a combination of honesty and dependability. So, so you got to be honest and, uh, and integrity and dependability are those virtues and values that are universal wherever you go. People with integrity can be counted on to do the right thing, which is the ethical thing. Do it correctly and do it one time. So when you do something correctly, you do it right the first time. You don't have to do it like over and over, you know. So, so it actually saves you in the long run. Okay. So accepting responsibility is part of ethical behavior as well. So you got to accept your responsibility. When, when you are uh, 
doing something and you are running a business and you are part of a company, accepting your responsibility is the first step in ethical behavior. Because by disseminating, by by sort of passing the bar, by telling that this is not your responsibility, you are actually trying to escape from what you're supposed to do. People who pass the blame onto others, they are not behaving ethically. You got to take the blame for what you do wrong or what your company does wrong. I mean, whatever is your your share of it, you got to be responsible for it. You can't just say it's not my problem; it's somebody else's. You gotta, you gotta take ownership of the problem. Uh, in total quality setting, people are responsible for their performance. When speaking of their organization, ethical people say means we instead of they. You see, that's that's the difference. When you di differentiate yourself from from the whole group, you are sort of, and you are part of that group, it is unethical. You've got to be including yourself in that, in that group because you are part of that group. Managers play a key role in ethics in organizations. They are responsible for setting an example of ethics. They say leading by example. In leadership course, if you remember, So, uh, where were we? Um, yeah, leading by example. We talked about it in the leaders course that you got to lead by example. Helping employees make ethical choices while you making those. Helping employees to follow through and behave ethically after making ethical choice. In carrying out these responsibilities, managers can use the best ratio approach black and white approach and full potential approach. So all these approaches, the best ratio approach is mostly looking at the best performing or best ethical approaches. You see those, you get the ratio or all the all, all the practices. Black and white, you try to, to put the extremes, separate them from each other. Black and white, you have this Why is black and white? Uh, black and white approach is you try to separate extreme approaches, separate extreme practices, like the best and the worst. You say this is the best practice and this is the worst practice. So and you and you try to bring in examples. You say this employee did this which was wrong and this employee did this which was right. And you try to show that to your employees in real case scenarios. And full potential approach, you are promoting everyone to perform to their to their full potential. Okay. So the organization's role in fostering ethical behavior includes creating an ethical environment and setting an ethical example. So uh, the ethical environment is what you need, and then ethical examples. The key in creating an eth ethical environment is having a comprehensive ethics policy. So companies are coming with ethics policy to make sure everybody is following them. Because if you don't have that policy, what could they rely on? I mean, it's true that they rely on their values and their common sense and everything, but at the same time, <coughs> at the same time, you need a policy in place. So that they can, in, in situations where they have questions or they are not sure, they can rely on those, uh, you know, policies. They have a, they have those policies in place to refer to. Uh, then, team setting an example is following by policy, following the policy, expecting all employees to follow the policy and rewarding those who do. So by 
by promoting and encouraging uh, employees to follow the policy, you're, you're encouraging them. You're encouraging them to, to do that. You're encouraging them to, 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 to rely on those policies. And that is what we've been talking about. Then, in handling ethical dilemmas, managers should select the option that is most likely to build trust. So, you are practically You're practically involving them. You're practically asking them and promoting them to, to rely on policies. In handling ethical dilemmas, managers should select the option that is most likely to build trust, integrity, and sense of responsibility, that is most likely to pass uh, various ethics tests. So, Yeah, Ms. Mina has a very good point. Getting feedback within the group. So those are really good ways to do that. People who believe in ethical values will sometimes make unethical decisions because of self-interest. So it's really important. Organizations generally recognize the responsibility to the community is in which they are in the building work. Yes, ethical organizations do that. They, they recognize the responsibility. They they, 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 they they realize they have a responsibility to their communities. That's very true. So so there there is a very Fine line between self-interest and ethical uh, or uh, value, uh, ethical value decision. So, the moment you want to make a decision, if you choose your self-interest and you make that decision, or you choose the ethical values and what they tell you, there will be a, a big difference. So, self-protection conflicting values or because they see benefit as being intangible or deferred. This is also what we talked about. I said if you need short run, like all those banks I mentioned to you, they are going for short run uh, benefits. Just quick numbers. They, they, they like quick numbers and that's why they are, uh, they are trying to get the result as fast as possible. So it is not necessarily beneficial to them. And that is not what we, what we want. Because in the long run, in the long run, what makes the difference is the ethical decisions they made. Of course, in the short run, they might have to expand they might have to spend money on that decision they make and don't get any reward immediately, but in the long run they will. Sorry, Therefore, donors make conditions for implementing it. Yeah, that's true. Key implements of corporate social responsibility include the ethical aspects of following issues, human rights, safety, and health business practice, governance, environmental engagement, consumer relations, marketplace activities, community involvement, and social development. So there are key elements included uh, the social responsibility. So we have human rights. Uh, the human rights part is really big because uh, human rights uh, it's expensive to try to comply with all these, but, but they will be rewarding in the long run. Safe, 
safety and health. So safety and health of your employees and your customers should be on top of your list. Business practice, governance, environmental engagement, consumer relations, marketplace activities, and then community involvement. All these are, are very important. Okay, so uh, that was a short explanation for the ethics. Now we are venturing into the next topic, which is partnering in the strategic alliances. So partnering in strategic alliances, innovative alliances, internal partnering, partnering with suppliers, with customers, with potential competitors, global partnering, education and business partnership. Yes, uh, Mr. Akhmal, uh, that is true. Sometimes because of the self-interest, self-protection or conflicting values, they, they decide the unethical each the decision is the right one for them and that's why they do that. A good example is like Bernie, Bernie Madoff, uh, the guy uh, who came up with those uh, money scheme and he, he used uh, like billions of dollars, what he, what he did he was he was just looking for his self-interest and he didn't care for, for the overall general, uh, you know, interest of people. He, he didn't care. All he cared was his self-interest. Or, or even in Even in the Enron example, so Bernie Madoff, he was the CEO of Nasdaq. He was pretty big, but but he decided that he rather his self interest. So, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's that's common. Okay. Any other questions regarding the ethics before we go to the next chapter? Any comments or questions? Okay. Very good. So let's go to the next chapter then. Just okay. Partnering. What do we mean by partnering? It means working together for mutual benefit. So when there is a mutual benefit and you want to work with another company, it's called partnering. It involves pooling resources, shares, uh, sharing costs, and cooperating in ways that mutually benefit all parties. So basically and practically you are working together and you have some shared benefits. You use your, your resources together and then you share the cost uh, to benefit, to mutually benefit. All the parties involved in the partnership will benefit from that. Partnership may be formed internally among the employees and externally with suppliers, customers and potential competitors. The purpose of partner, partnering is to enhance competitiveness. So the whole purpose of partnership is to increase and enhance competitiveness. The formation of partnership should be a systematic process involving such steps as development of partnership, partnering briefing, identification of potential partners, identification of key decision makers, and implementation of partnership. So, so when it comes to partnership, there should be some benefit in it for two companies 
that they want to work together or how many companies. And then they, they pool their resources, they share their costs, they make sure they, they implement uh, that, that partnership that they well plan ahead and those decision makers, they need to be identified so that the work partnership is going to work properly. So internal partnering operates on three levels. So management to employee, team to team partnership, and employee to employee. So the purpose of internal partnership is to harness the full potential of the workforce uh, to focus on a continuous improvement of quality. So the concept of total quality management is kind of uh, well, uh, you know, enhanced when we use the partnership, uh, and that's because of the internal partnership. Because the internal partnership, it could be done with the departments of the of the company. So the actual departments of the company will will be. Uh, will be basically partnering with each other for the purpose of total quality management. So what happens is you are partnering, like let's say you're the manager of the company, so you partner with the, with the staff to make sure you are you are doing what you're supposed to do and you are getting all those uh, feedbacks from your employees and vice versa. So that concept is, is very, very practical when it comes to uh, total quality management. So As you can see, the in, in, internal partnering is also called employee involvement. So, in a sense, what we just talked about, which was uh, the, the total quality management uh, and the internal partnership relationship, is well explained here because in total quality management, we need the employee involvement, and it's actually a form of internal partnership. or employee empowerment, if you will. Successful internal partnership requires a supportive environment, structured mechanisms, and mutually supportive alliances. So, so in order to be successful in empowering your employees, you need to, to provide a supportive environment for employees. You can't just have them be empowered or, or partnering with each other without providing the required environment for those guys to be successfully doing that. So it's your responsibility as their managers to, 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 to make it possible because without it, it's, it's not practical and it's not possible. Then structural mechanisms. You need to provide those structural mechanisms as well. So you can't just uh, the environment and the structural mechanism, the structure, the system, the way they communicate with each other, the possibility of uh, management to employees and employees to management communication should, should, should be in place. And it doesn't come into place by itself. It takes ma uh, management role and control in that. And it should be 
done to mutually uh, supportive alliances. Then we have uh, partnering with strategic alliances. The goal of supplier partnership is to create and maintain a loyal, trusting partnership that will allow both partners to win while promoting the continuous improvement of quality. So the supplier partnership, though, it's, uh, it's done in order to uh, Create those lo that that loyalty, the trusting relationship between you and the supplier. So it will affect your quality. It will affect your productivity and competitiveness. So so it's not just the partnership, internal partnership, that is going to help you. Partnership is actually one of the strategies used in order to have a good total quality approach. Because when you partner with your supplier as well as your uh, like internal partnership, you are in a sense promoting that total quality approach to your supplier as well as your own company. Because it's the case that you might be doing a very good job when it comes to total quality management within your own company, but because you're also related to your to your other sides of business, which is perhaps your your suppliers, your uh, like outbound logistics, like distributors. It's it's also important to be able to involve them in the total quality management approach, because it will sometimes your partners. Uh, work will be representing you and you don't want to misrepresent you and show you as non-quality or non-total quality service providers to your customers. So that's why uh, having partnership with your, with your suppliers or distributors will help you to promote that total quality approach to them and make sure they meet those the standards that you, all, you have already in place for your own company. So it's actually a good strategy. And by that, you will eventually get the, to, uh, the uh, competitiveness over your rivals. So um, the requirements for success in supplier partnership includes the following, the supplier personnel should interact with employees who actually use their products. The price only criteria in the buyer supplier relationship should be eliminated. So, uh, only relying on price is not the smartest choice, as you well know. So, a lot of other factors are involved. So, the quality of uh, the products delivered should be guaranteed by the supplier. The supplier should be proficient in just in time. The JIT is actually very, very common now. Like Toyota was a pioneer in JIT, which is just in time inventory. Uh, and both parties should be capable of sharing information. And Toyota would be only able to, to work with those suppliers who are able to, to mm, you know, make that JIT uh, inventory possible because when it comes to just in time, you are, you are in need of a product right away and you got to get it right away. So it's very important for you to to communicate that with your supplier. So having a partnership with your supplier is going to help you a lot in the sense that you got to get the inventory right away because you are not keeping inventory uh, and the items in your inventory all the time. You just get them when you need them. And that's why uh, 
your supplier should be in partnership with you. And that's why the uh, Toyota was really successful in that because they made a lot of partnership with their uh, with their suppliers, and that was how they were able to do the trick. So that helped them to to save money on the stocking and all that because and Dell, when it comes to computer, they do that the same. When you order a computer, they they gather the uh, items together, they assemble them, but they don't have them in their inventory right away. They just get them. As, as the orders come in. So that has been a very successful method of total quality companies, or total quality approach companies. Then the goal of a supplier partnership. So supplier partnerships typically the, the develop in the following stages, uncertainty and tentativeness. So sometimes you're not there is there is a certain level of uncertainty that you gotta uh, tolerate when it comes to JIT. and then the tentativeness, so the tentative offers, all that is a concept you gotta get used to it. The short term pressure, you will be under short term pressure the moment an order comes in, and you gotta assemble everything as soon as possible. So the end product, you know, the the lead time should not be longer than companies that they have uh, the, the inventory, the items in their inventory. It actually should be shorter. So there is pressure for you. And then realization of the need for new approaches, adoption of new paradigms, awareness of potential adoption of new values, and mature partnering. All these tools are for you to be able to have a successful partnering alliance. Let's just pause here. Uh, are there any questions or comments so far? How are we doing? How is everybody following the concepts? Or do you have any questions for me? Okay, very good. So the rationale for forming customer partnership is customer satisfaction. This is a very interesting concept of looking at your customers as partner is very, very interesting. And it's becoming more and more common nowadays. Uh, the reason being that uh, the customer used to be just the one who would buy your product and that was all that you would expect from a customer. That you just sell your product to your customer and if you're lucky, your customer will come back again and again and keep on buying your products. That was a traditional approach to the customer. But nowadays, there is there's much more to it than what it was before. It's actually the partnership you, you create with your with your customer. Because the customer is actually involved as partner in the product development process. Uh, the best way to show competitors. The customers define quality as a fundamental aspect. Because customers word of mouth, customers' happiness with you is helping you to be successful or, uh, you know, unsuccessful. The, the level of involvement of customer is what you should be looking for. Because if the customer is involved, the best word of mouth, the best marketing you could, you could send out 
is your customer satisfaction. Because no matter how good you say you are, you are as good as your customer think you are. And because of that, if you have that partnership, your loyal customers, if they are they're eager to take you out to the market and tell your your future customers how good you are, you are actual actually uh, at your best shape. So that's the concept of total quality management when it comes to the, 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 the partnership. You are creating a partnership with your, with your customers as well. So it's, it's way bigger than what it could be without it. Okay, any questions? We have these SMEs in place, the small and medium sized enterprises. And uh, even those that compose in the same market can benefit from partner. So, partnership is something that could benefit even the small and medium sized enterprises. The most widely practiced form of partnership among SMEs is the manufacturing network. The manufacturing network is a group of SMEs that cooperate. Uh, in ways that enhance their quality, productivity, and competitiveness. Mutual media interdependence are the characteristics that make manufacturing networks succeed. Widely practiced network activities include joint production, education and training, marketing, product development, technology transfer, and purchasing. So as you can see that it comes from a level of SMEs that covers a lot of corporations nowadays. A lot of companies are small and medium sized. Like when it comes to US, the majority of companies are small and medium sized enterprises. And they actually use partnership very, very efficiently in the level of the uh, manufacturing networks that we just talked about, in the level of uh, joint production, education and training. So they, they do their education and training together, their marketing, their product development, transferring their technology to each other, and finally purchasing. So that is very, very uh, useful for those guys. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so education and business partnership are formed and help form to help organizations continually improve their people and how well they interact with process technologies. Services provided include on-site customized training, workshops, seminars, technical assistance, and consulting. So education and business partnership is actually a very big, big key. Uh, I was involved in a in a company, in a consulting company while I was in Malaysia uh, back in 2007, 2009. Uh, and we were hugely involved in these kind of practices, uh, organizing the, these kind of events, educational events, uh, like on-site customized training for, or workshops or seminars for technical assistance and consultation to companies like Toyota, like uh, K-Lox, like Chartered Bank, all those companies, the big companies, international, even local Malaysian companies. And we were trying to use best techniques and approaches and methods to, to help them uh, succeed in the market. <coughs> and it's very, very useful uh, for, for the company to to involve these, these consultancies and education sites onto their uh, like programs continuously uh, and quite often in order to improve and enhance their workmanship all the time. So it's, it's really a good approach and, it's, and a lot of companies partner with each other, even the training companies or com consulting companies partner with each other to to deliver services or trainings to some partners as their 
uh, client. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the last slide here. So these are really useful. So before we go to the next topic, uh, are there any questions? Any questions or comments before I go to to the next topic? Okay. Very good. So Quality culture, changing hearts, minds, and attitudes. So in order to be successful uh, in total quality approach, we got to have a quality culture. This is a very interesting topic that we're going to talk about. Understanding what a quality culture is, quality culture versus traditional cultures, is activating cultural change, and then change leaders to activate change and laying the groundwork for a quality culture. So learning what a quality culture looks like and countering resistance to cultural change and establishing quality culture and maintaining a quality culture. So these are also the continuation topics that we're going to talk about. We've got to learn what a quality culture looks like we got to understand the counter resistance to cultural change and establishing a quality culture, maintaining a quality culture. A quality culture, so the definition comes here, is an organizational value system that results in an environmental that is conducive to the establishment and continual improvement of quality. So it should be a, an organizational value system. So all through the organization, organization-wide, we should come up with a value system. And it should result in an environment that conduces, encourages, enhances, improves uh, to the establishment and continual improvement of quality. So systematic quality improvement is what it is. The quality culture is a systematic organization-wide quality improvement. It consists of values, we talked about it in ethics, moralities, and the values of quality values, traditions, procedures, and ex expectations that promote quality. <laughs> because it's important to know and note that there are standards. In every company, there is a standard. And that standard is what they, they expect you to, to give your product. I mean, your product should meet those standards in order for you to, to be accepted. But what happens is the quality standards is very beyond and above a regular normal quality cult that everybody has. The quality standard stands above and beyond that. That's what you should be promoting and looking at. Implementing total quality necessitates, necessitates cultural change in an organization for the following reasons. So the culture change should happen because change cannot occur in a hostile environment. So you got to know, you got to understand that change cannot occur in a hostile, unfriendly environment. It should be a friendly environment. The cultural change only happens in a friendly one. Moving the total quality takes time. So you gotta understand if you're if you are a short short time 
uh, business planner, if you're a person who wants to make money as fast as possible, total quality is not good for you. Total quality approach is for good for those who want to be there for a long time. Look at, just uh, to get an idea, you got to look at those companies that are using total quality. They have been around forever, and they they don't look like leaving the industry that soon. They are they are there. They are well grounded, and they are the most successful. But they they didn't happen right away. You know, companies that are just are just looking for fast uh, paced results, like those banks I mentioned, like. Wells Fargo or those banks are just looking for immediate numbers. Those are those will be out very soon. Those guys are uh, are not going to last forever. Those guys are are not into total quality approach and all that. It can be difficult to overcome that past. So uh, it's difficult to overcome the past. So that cultural change is really necessary for you to make those changes. All right. So change can be difficult because resisting change is a natural human behavior. We talked about natural human behavior. We don't like change. We rather stability. We rather to stay the way we are. We want to, you know, do what we're doing. We don't want to change, you know. And that's why we resist it. And the fact that we resist it is actually uh, it has a detrimental uh, effect on quality, total quality improvement. For us to be successful in total quality approach, we need to uh, be able to to welcome change. We need to be able to, you know, bring in change. But it's against our our natural behavior. So in an A organization, there will be an advocate of change and resistors. There will be people who say no. They say no to change. So total quality management it, it arouses a lot of resistance. And sometimes advocates focus so intently on the expected benefits of change that they fail to realize how the change will be perceived by potential resistance. So people resist change for the following reasons. They are fearful of it. They'll lose control. Their loss of control is, is one of the factors they don't like it. They are uncertain. And they, they're more work, you know? People rather work less sometimes. I mean, they rather just relax, they, they rather do what they, they're supposed to do, and the rest, they just want to relax. So if they're required to work more, they probably would say no, because they don't want that. And and for those who are promoting those total quality management and all that, is to understand these, these, these reasons behind those who are resisting change, and try to, to tackle those properly. You can't just say, okay, you have to change it. You've got to do it because I tell you. You've got to make them understand the benefits. That's where, where the uh, ethical side, where the reasoning and understanding side, where the group work, where the involvement, of the, where the internal partnership comes in place. You know, that's where uh, all these factors are going to help you to implement those those changing attitudes and changing culture and behavior. So without that, you won't be successful, and you got to understand that. Okay. So any questions so far before we go into the the, the task? Are there any comments or questions? Okay, no comments. So let's go to the task. Okay. Please mention an ethical 
dilemma case you had and explain how you decided Okay, please tell us about an uh, ethical dilemma that you had and explain how you decided. So this is for your own company. I want you to give me a personal example of your ethical dilemma, how you performed, what, what you decided based on what or what not, and what was the result and all that. You could just give me a brief example of, let's say, you had something in your company or organization, an NGO or whatever you, wherever you work for, and how you decided and how you performed and how it affected the company and all that. So just take a moment, think about it, let me know. We will discuss it in a few minutes. Okay, any questions about the task? Okay, it looks like there's no question. So I'll just give you a few minutes uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get back on it. Okay.
so I have your answers here. So, Ms. Mina, conflict within the team was a big challenge for uh, us, particularly in our field office. Uh, conducing conflict management session was quite helpful for us in the past few months. So, group internal assessment was another method. Okay. Yeah, but if you could explain a bit more, uh, like what kind of ethical decision or dilemma, like let's say you have to make a decision on, let's say, forego of a profit or something and then decide to do something which was more ethical or, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, the most important example of ethical dilemma case I want to mention is in our current governmental organization due to having no integrity, honesty in the work and so just to public because of their corruption and having no not any model or policy to be for the civilians because most of the employees and today have come up and accepting their responsibility as part of ethical behavior. And the, the managers are not really willing to play key roles in their institutions. There are no rewarding system for those who follow the codes in the country, and there is uh, no trustful options selected for those who trust people. Okay, very good. Yeah, good examples. Uh, yeah, very good. And almost. For, for sure, we have had ethical dilemmas and situations where, where we were not sure what to do. You know, the government policy or the company policy might have told us to do something, but, it against, but it's against ethical values and standards. So that's, those are a good example. Mr. Nazari, would you like to tell us your example like all the time? Would you want to read it out to the class and speak it up? Excuse me, today I had a problem. Mm -hmm. The voice was very low. Yeah, I couldn't uh, understand uh, very well to the lesson. Oh, but anyhow, that uh, uh, our project uh, is uh, funded by World Bank, and then for uh, uh, one or two years we had problem after uh, the World Bank uh, su supervised mission coming and evaluating our project and so so it was <coughs> the activity in our work was not uh, satisfactory so so we had some problem and some uh, uh, weakness in our work in the fields so but uh, our uh, team they tried their best uh, and they decided we have to improve and then in uh, one or two years uh, uh, we would like to show to the World Bank mission that uh, a lot of uh, improvement uh, has been made and then uh, we showed to them and then uh, uh, in, uh, after, after three years so our program and project become uh, satisfactory so so this was one of the uh, the things which uh, happened with our project. So now our project uh, changed to uh, a national program. Mm -hmm. uh, our uh, project to national uh, horticulture livestock project, and then uh, World Bank is uh, ready to support it for uh, uh, 2013 up to 2018 for six years, so this was one of the uh, things which, which happened with our project. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So very well, thank you everyone. Are there any questions before we finish the class? Uh, I see one comment from Ms. Mina. Policies can be...
Yeah, but what we mean by dilemma is mostly uh, when you are in a situation that you have to choose between one of the two, and mostly both of them, they have uh, some repercussions and consequences for you. So both of them are normally bad. So, and you have to choose the one which is less, uh, you know, detriment to your situation. Like when we're talking about ethical dilemmas is when you are dealing with something that is giving you an unethical reward and the one which is giving you an ethical reward but there is no money value to it. So those are what we mean by ethical dilemma. So policies can put you in a dilemma uh, and then what you choose is your action in that dilemma. So free comment. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Please don't forget to email your answers to me, though. Uh, you have a nice week. Uh, it was uh, nice seeing you, and I look forward to see you in the next week, our next session. Thank you.